Chapter Twenty Two of The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter Twenty Two. More than an hour had elapsed since the wanderer and Unorna had finally turned the key upon Israel Kafka, leaving him to his own reflections. During the first moments he made desperate efforts to get out of the conservatory, throwing himself with all his weight and strength against the doors and thrusting the point of his long knife into the small apertures of the locks. Then seeing that every attempt was fruitless, he desisted and sat down in a state of complete exhaustion. A reaction began to set in after the furious excitement of the afternoon, and he felt all at once that it would be impossible for him to make another step or raise his arm to strike. A man less sound originally in bodily constitution would have broken down sooner, and it was a proof of Israel Kafka's extraordinary vigor and energy that he did not lose his senses in a delirious fever at the moment when he felt that his strength could bear no further strain. But his thoughts, such as they were, did not lack clearness. He saw that his opportunity was gone, and he began to think of the future, wondering what would take place next. Assuredly, when he had come to Unorna's house with the fixed determination to take her life, the last thing that he had expected had been to be taken prisoner and left to his own meditations. It was clear that the wanderer's warning had been conveyed without loss of time, and had saved Unorna from her immediate fate. Nevertheless, he did not regret having given her the opportunity of defending herself. He had not meant that there should be any secret about the deed, for he was ready to sacrifice his own life in executing it. Yet he was not altogether brave. He had neither Unorna's innate indifference to physical danger, nor the wanderer's calm superiority to fear. He would not have made a good soldier, and he could not have faced another man's pistol at fifteen paces without experiencing a mental and bodily commotion not unlike terror, which he might or might not have concealed from others, but which would in any case have been painfully apparent to himself. It is a noticeable fact in human nature that a man of even ordinary courage will at any time, when under excitement, risk his life rather than his happiness. Moreover, an immense number of individuals, naturally far from brave, destroy their own lives yearly in the moment when all chances of happiness are temporarily eclipsed. The inference seems to be that mankind, on the whole, values happiness more highly than life. The proportion of suicides from so-called honorable motives is small as compared with the many committed out of despair. Israel Kafka's case was by no means a rare one. The fact of having made to play a part which to him seemed at once blasphemous and ignoble had indeed turned the scale, but was not the motive. In all things, the final touch which destroys the balance is commonly mistaken for the force which has originally produced a state of unstable equilibrium, whereas there is very often no connection between the one and the other. The Moravian himself believed that the sacrifice of Unorna, and of himself afterwards, was to be an expiation of the outrage Unorna had put upon his faith in his own person. He had merely seized upon the first excuse which presented itself for ending all, because he was in reality past hope. We have as yet no absolute test of sanity, as we have of fever in the body and of many other unnatural conditions of the human organism. The only approximately accurate judgments in the patient's favor are obtained from examinations into the relative consecutiveness and consistency of thought in the individual examined when the whole tendency of that thought is towards an end conceivably approvable by a majority of men. A great many philosophers and thinkers have accordingly been pronounced insane at one period of history, and have been held up as models of sanity at another. The most immediately destructive consequences of individual reasoning on a limited scale 
murder and suicide, have been successfully regarded as heroic acts, as criminal deeds, and as the deplorable but explicable actions of irresponsible beings in consecutive ages of violence, strict law, and humanitarianism. It seems to be believed that the combination of murder and suicide is more commonly observed under the last of the three reigns than it was under the first. It was undoubtedly least common under the second. In other words, it appears probable that the practice of considering certain crimes as the result of insanity has a tendency to make those crimes increase in number, as they undoubtedly increase in barbarity from year to year. Meanwhile, however, no definite conclusion has been reached as to the state of mind of a man who murders the woman he loves and then ends his own life. Israel Kafka may therefore be regarded as mad or sane. In favor of the theory of his madness the total uselessness of the deed he contemplated may be adduced. On the other hand, the extremely consecutive and consistent nature of his thoughts and actions gives evidence of his sanity. When he found himself a prisoner in Unorna's conservatory, his intention underwent no change though his body was broken with fatigue and his nerves with the long-continued strain of a terrible excitement. His determination was as cool and as fixed as ever. These somewhat dry reflections seem necessary to the understanding of what followed. The key turned in the lock and the bolt was slipped back. Instantly Israel Kafka's energy returned. He rose quickly and hid himself in the shrubbery, in a position from which he could observe the door. He had seen Unorna enter before and had of course heard her cry before the wanderer had carried her away, and he had believed that she had wished to face him, either with the intention of throwing herself upon his mercy or in the hope of dominating him with her eyes as she had so often done before. Of course he had no means of knowing that she had already left the house. He imagined that the wanderer had gone and that Unorna, being freed from his restraint, was about to enter the place again. The door opened and the three men came in. Kafka's first idea, on seeing himself disappointed, was that they had come to take him into custody, and his first impulse was to elude them. The wanderer entered first, tall, stately, indifferent the quick glance of his deep eyes alone betraying that he was looking for someone. Next came Keyork Arabian, muffled still in his furs, turning his head sharply from side to side in the midst of the sable collar that half buried it, and evidently nervous. Last of all, the individual, who had divested himself of his outer coat and whose powerful proportions did not escape Israel Kafka's observation. It was clear that if there were a struggle it could have but one issue. Kafka would be overpowered. His knowledge of the disposition of the plants and trees offered him a hope of escape. The three men had entered the conservatory, and if he could reach the door before they noticed him, he could lock it upon them, as it had been locked upon himself. He could hear their footsteps on the marble pavement very near him, and he caught glimpses of their moving figures through the thick leaves. With cat-like tread he glided along the shadows of the foliage until he could see the door. From the entrance an open way was left in a straight line towards the middle of the hall, down which his pursuers were still slowly walking. He must cross an open space in the line of their vision in order to get out, and he calculated the distance to be traversed while listening to their movements, until he felt sure that they were so far from the door as not to be able to reach him. Then he made his attempt, darting across the smooth pavement with his knife in his hand. There was no one in the way. Then came a violent shock, and he was held as in a vice, so tightly that he could not believe himself in the arms of a human being. His captors had anticipated that he would try to escape, and has posted the individual in the shadow of a tree near the doorway. The deaf and dumb man had received his instructions by means of a couple of quick signs and not a whisper had betrayed the measures taken. Kafka struggled desperately, for he was within three feet of the door and still believed an escape possible. He tried to strike behind him with his sharp blade of which a single touch would have severed muscle and sinew like silk threads, but the bear-like embrace seemed to confine his whole body, 
his arms and even his wrists. Then he felt himself turn round and the individual pushed him towards the middle of the hall. The wanderer was advancing quickly, and Keyork Arabian, who had again fallen behind, peered at Kafka from behind his tall companion, with a grotesque expression in which bodily fear and a desire to laugh at the captive were strongly intermingled. "'It is of no use to resist,' said the wanderer quietly. "'We are too strong for you.' Kafka said nothing, but his bloodshot eyes glared up angrily at the tall man's face. "'He looks dangerous, and he still has that thing in his hand.' said Keyork Arabian. I think I will give him either at once, while the individual holds him. Perhaps you could do it." "'You will do nothing of the kind,' the wanderer answered. "'What a coward you are, Keyork," he added contemptuously. Going to Kafka's side, he took him by the wrist of the hand which held the knife, but Kafka still clutched it firmly. "'You had better give it up,' he said. Kafka shook his head angrily and set his teeth, but the wanderer unclasped the fingers by quiet force and took the weapon away. He handed it to Keyork, who breathed a sigh of relief as he looked at it, smiling at last and holding his head on one side. "'To think,' he soliloquized, "'that an inch of such pretty stuff as Damascus steel, in the right place, can draw the sharp red line between time and eternity.' He put the knife tenderly away in the bosom of his fur coat. His whole manner changed, and he came forward with his usual, almost jaunty step. "'And now that you are quite harmless, my dear friend,' he said, addressing Israel Kafka, "'I hope to make you see the folly of your ways. I suppose you know that you are quite mad, and that the proper place for you is in a lunatic asylum.' The wanderer laid his hand heavily upon Kayark's shoulder. "'Remember what I told you,' he said sternly. "'He will be reasonable now. Make your fellow understand that he is to let him go.' "'Better shut the door first, said Keyork, suiting the action to the word, and then coming back. "'Make haste,' said the wanderer with impatience. "'The man is ill, whether he is mad or not.' Released at last from the individual's iron grip, Israel Kafka staggered a little. The wanderer took him kindly by the arm, supporting his steps and leading him to a seat. Kafka glanced suspiciously at him and at the other two, but seemed unable to make any further effort and sank back with a low groan. His face grew pale and his eyelids drooped. "'Get some wine, something to restore him,' the wanderer said. Keyork looked at the Moravian critically for a moment. "'Yes,' he assented. He is more exhausted than I thought. He is not very dangerous now." Then he went in search of what was needed. The individual retired to a distance and stood looking on with folded arms. "'Do you hear me?' asked the wanderer, speaking gently. "'Do you understand what I say?' Israel Kafka nodded, but said nothing. "'You are very ill. This foolish idea that has possessed you this evening comes from your illness. Will you go away quietly with me and make no resistance, so that I may take care of you?" This time there was not even a movement of the head. "'This is merely a passing thing,' the wanderer continued in a tone of quiet encouragement. "'You have been feverish and excited, and I dare say you have been too much alone of late. If you will come with me, I will take care of you and see that all is well." "'I told you that I would kill her, and I will,' said Israel Kafka, faintly but distinctly. "'You will not kill her,' answered his companion. "'I will prevent you from attempting it, and as soon as you are well you will see the absurdity of the idea.' Israel Kafka made an impatient gesture feeble but sufficiently expressive. Then all at once his limbs relaxed, and his head fell forward upon his breast. The wanderer started to his feet and moved him into a more comfortable position. There were one or two quickly drawn breaths, and the breathing ceased altogether. At that moment Keyork returned carrying a bottle of wine and a glass. "'It is too late,' 
said the wanderer gravely. Israel Kafka is dead. Dead! exclaimed Keork, setting down what he had in his hands, and hastening to examine the unfortunate man's face and eyes. The individual squeezed him a little too hard, I suppose, he added, applying his ear to the region of the heart, and moving his head about a little as he did so. I hate men who make statements about things they do not understand, he said viciously, looking up as he spoke, but without any expression of satisfaction. He is no more dead than you are, the greater pity. It would have been so convenient. It is nothing but a slight syncope, probably the result of poorness of blood and an overexcited state of the nervous system. Help me to lay him on his back. You ought to have known that was the only thing to do. Put a cushion under his head. There, he will come to himself presently, but he will not be so dangerous as he was. The wanderer drew a long breath of relief as he helped Keork to make the necessary arrangements. "'How long will it last?' he inquired. "'How can I tell?' returned Keork sharply. "'Have you never heard of a syncope? Do you know nothing about anything?' He had produced a bottle containing some very strong salt and was applying it to the unconscious man's nostrils. The wanderer paid no attention to his irritable temper and stood looking on. A long time passed, and yet the Moravian gave no further signs of consciousness. "'It is clear that he cannot stay here if he is to be seriously ill,' the wanderer said. "'And it is equally clear that he cannot be taken away,' retorted Keork. "'You seem to be in a very combative frame of mind,' the other answered, sitting down and looking at his watch. If you cannot revive him, he ought to be brought to more comfortable quarters for the night. In his present condition, of course," said Keork, with a sneer. Do you think he would be in any danger on the way? I never think. I know," snarled the sage. The wanderer showed a slight surprise at the roughness of the answer, but said nothing, contenting himself with watching the proceedings keenly. He was by no means past suspecting that Keork might apply some medicine the very reverse of reviving, if left to himself. For the present there seemed to be no danger. The pungent smell of salts of ammonia pervaded the place, but the wanderer knew that Keork had a bottle of ether in the pocket of his coat, and he rightly judged that a very little of that would put an end to the life that was hanging in the balance. Nearly half an hour passed before either spoke again. Then Keork looked up. This time his voice was smooth and persuasive. His irritability had all disappeared. "'You must be tired,' he said. "'Why do you not go home? Or else go to my house and wait for us. The individual and I can take care of him very well.' "'Thanks,' replied the wanderer with a slight smile. "'I am not in the least tired, and I prefer to stay where I am. I am not hindering you, I believe. Now Keork Arabian had no interest in allowing Israel Kafka to die, though the wanderer half believed that he had, though he could not imagine what that interest might be. The little man was in reality on the track of an experiment, and he knew very well that so long as he was so narrowly watched it would be quite impossible to try it. In spite of his sneers at his companion's ignorance, he was aware that the latter knew enough to make every effort conducive to reviving the patient if left to himself, and he submitted with a bad grace to doing what he would rather have left undone. He would have wished to let the flame of life sink yet lower before making it brighten again, for he had with him a preparation which he had been carrying in his pocket for months in the hope of accidentally happening upon just such a case as the present, and he longed for an opportunity of trying it but to give it a fair trial he wished to apply it at the precise point when, according to all previous experience, the moment of death was past, the moment when the physician usually puts his watch in his pocket and looks about for his hat. Possibly if Kafka, being left without any assistance, had shown no further signs of sinking, Keork would have helped him to sink a little lower. To produce this much-desired result, he had nothing with him but the ether of which the wanderer, of course, knew the smell and understood the effects. 
he saw the chances of making the experiment upon an excellent subject slipping away before his eyes, and he grew more angry in proportion as they seemed farther removed. "'He is a little better,' he said discontentedly, after another long interval of silence. The wanderer bent down and saw that the eyelids were quivering and that the face was less deathly livid than before. Then the eyes opened and stared dreamily at the glass roof. "'And I will,' said the faint, weak voice, as though completing a sentence. "'I think not,' observed Keorg, as though answering. "'The people who do what they mean to do are not always talking about will.' But Kafka had closed his eyes again. This time, however, his breathing was apparent, and he was evidently returning to a conscious state. The wanderer ranged the pillow more comfortably under his head and covered him with his own furs. Keorg, relinquishing all hopes of trying the experiment at present, poured a little wine down his throat. "'Do you think we can take him home tonight?' inquired the wanderer. He was prepared for an ill-tempered answer, but not for what Keorg actually said. The little man got upon his feet and coolly buttoned his coat. "'I think not.' he replied. There is nothing to be done but to keep him quiet. Good night. I am tired of all this nonsense, and I do not mean to lose my night's rest for all the Israels in Jewry, or all the Jews in Israel. You can stay with him if you please." Thereupon he turned on his heel, making a sign to the individual who had not moved from his place since Kafka had lost consciousness, and who immediately followed his master. I will come and see to him in the morning," said Keorg carelessly, as he disappeared from sight among the plants. The wanderer's long-suffering temper was roused, and his eyes gleamed angrily as he looked after the departing sage. "'Hound!' he exclaimed in a very audible voice. He hardly knew why he was so angry with the man who called himself his friend. Keorg had behaved no worse than an ordinary doctor for he had stayed until the danger was over and had promised to come again in the morning. It was his cool way of disclaiming all further responsibility, and of avoiding all further trouble which elicited the wanderer's resentment, as well as the unpleasant position in which the latter found himself. He had certainly not anticipated being left in charge of a sick man, and that sick man Israel Kafka, in Unorna's house for the whole night, and he did not enjoy the prospect. The mere detail of having to give some explanation to the servants, who would doubtless come before long to extinguish the lights, was far from pleasant. Moreover, though Keorg had declared the patient out of danger, there seemed to be no absolute certainty that a relapse would not take place before morning, that Kafka might actually lay in the certainty, delusive enough, that Unorna could not return until the following day. He did not dare to take upon himself the responsibility of calling someone to help him, and of removing the Moravian in his present condition. The man was still very weak and either altogether unconscious, or sleeping the sleep of exhaustion. The weather, too, was bitterly cold, and the exposure to the night air might bring on immediate and fatal consequences. He examined Kafka closely, and came to the conclusion that he was really asleep to wake him would be absolutely cruel as well as dangerous. He looked kindly at the weary face, and then began to walk up and down between the plants, coming back at the end of every turn to look again and assure himself that no change had taken place. After some time he began to wonder at the total silence in the house, or rather the silence which was carefully provided for in the conservatory impressed itself upon him for the first time. It was strange, he thought, that no one came to put out the lamps. He thought of looking out into the vestibule beyond, to see whether the lights were still burning there. To his great surprise, he found the door securely fastened. Keorg Arabian had undoubtedly locked him in, and to all intents and purposes he was a prisoner. He suspected some treachery, but in this he was mistaken. Keorg's sole intention had been to ensure himself from being disturbed in the course of the night by a second visit from the wanderer, accompanied perhaps by Kafka. It immediately occurred to the wanderer that he could ring the bell. But disliking the idea of entering into an explanation, he reserved that for an emergency. 
Had he attempted it, he would have been still further surprised to find that it would have produced no result. In going through the vestibule, Keorg had used Kafka's sharp knife to cut one of the slender, silk-covered copper wires which passed out of the conservatory on that side, communicating with the servants' quarters. He was perfectly acquainted with all such details of the household arrangement. Keorg's precautions were in reality useless, and they merely illustrate the ruthlessly selfish character of the man. The wanderer would in all probability neither have attempted to leave the house with Kafka that night, nor to communicate with the servants, even if he had been left free to do either, and if no one had disturbed him in his watch. He was disturbed, however, and very unexpectedly, between half-past one and a quarter to two in the morning. More than once he had remained seated for a long time, but his eyes were growing heavy and he roused himself and walked again until he was thoroughly awake. It was certainly true that, of all the persons concerned in the events of the day, except Keorg, he had undergone the least bodily fatigue and mental excitement. But even to the strongest, the hours of the night spent in watching by a sick person seem endless when there is no really strong personal anxiety felt. He was undoubtedly interested in Kafka's fate, and was resolved to protect him as well as to hinder him from committing any act of folly. But he had only met him for the first time that very afternoon and, under circumstances which had not in the first instance suggested even the possibility of a friendship between the two. His position towards Israel Kafka was altogether unexpected, and what he felt was no more than pity for his sufferings and indignation against those who had caused them. When the door was suddenly opened, he stood still in his walk and faced it. He hardly recognized Unorna in the pale, disheveled woman with circled eyes who came towards him under the bright light. She too stood still when she saw him, starting suddenly. She seemed to be very cold, for she shivered visibly and her teeth were chattering. Without the least protection against the bitter night air, she had fled bareheaded and cloakless through the open streets from the church to her home. "'You here?' she exclaimed in an unsteady voice. "'Yes, I am still here,' answered the wanderer. "'But I hardly expected you to come back to-night,' he added. At the sound of his voice a strange smile came into her wan face and lingered there. She had not thought to hear him speak again, kindly or unkindly, for she had come with the fixed determination to meet her death at Israel Kafka's hands, and to let that be the end. Amid all the wild thoughts that had whirled through her brain as she ran home in the dark, that one had not once changed. "'And Israel Kafka?' she asked, almost timidly. "'He is there, asleep.' Unorna came forward, and the wanderer showed her where the man lay upon a thick carpet, wrapped in furs, his pale head supported by a cushion. "'He is very ill.' she said, almost under her breath. "'Tell me what has happened.' It was like a dream to her. The tremendous excitement of what had happened in the convent had cut her off from the realization of what had gone before. Strange as it seemed even to herself, she scarcely comprehended the intimate connection between the two series of events, nor the bearing of the one upon the other. Israel Kafka sank into such insignificance that she had began to pity his condition and it was hard to remember that the wanderer was the man whom Beatrice had loved, and of whom she had spoken so long and so passionately. She found, too, an unreasoned joy in being once more by his side, no matter under what conditions. In that happiness, one-sided and unshared, she forgot everything else. Beatrice had been a dream, a vision, an unreal shadow. Kafka was nothing to her, and yet everything as she suddenly saw, since he constituted a bond between her and the man she loved, which would at least outlast the night. In a flash she saw that the wanderer would not leave her alone with the Moravian, and that the latter could not be moved for the present without danger to his life. They must watch together by his side through the long hours. Who could tell what the night would bring forth? As the new development of the situation presented itself, the color rose again to her cheeks. 
The warmth of the conservatory, too, dispelled the chill that had penetrated her, and the familiar odors of the flowers contributed to restore the lost equilibrium of mind and body. "'Tell me what has happened,' she said again. In the fewest possible words the wanderer told her all that had occurred up to the moment of her coming, not omitting the detail of the locked door. "'And for what reason do you suppose that Keorg shut you in?' she asked. "'I do not know,' the wanderer answered. "'I do not trust him, though I have known him so long.' "'It was mere selfishness,' said Unorna scornfully. "'I know him better than you do. He was afraid you would disturb him again in the night.' The wanderer said nothing, wondering how any man could be so elaborately thoughtful of his own comfort. "'There is no help for it,' Unorna said. "'We must watch together.' "'I see no other way,' the wanderer answered indifferently. He placed a chair for her to sit in, within sight of the sick man, and took one himself, wondering at the strained situation, and yet not caring to ask Unorna what had brought her back, so breathless and so pale, at such an hour. He believed, not unnaturally, that her motive had been either anxiety for himself or the irresistible longing to see him again coupled with a distrust of his promise to return when she should send for him. It seemed best to accept her appearance without question, lest an inquiry should lead to a fresh outburst, more unbearable now than before, since there seemed to be no way of leaving the house without exposing her to danger. A nervous man like Israel Kafka might spring up at any moment and do something dangerous. After they had taken their places the silence lasted some moments. "'You did not believe all I told you this evening?' said Unorna softly, with an interrogation in her voice. "'No,' the wanderer answered quietly. "'I did not.' "'I am glad of that. I was mad when I spoke.'" End of chapter 22《Of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale. — This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale, by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 23 the wanderer was not inclined to deny the statement which accorded well enough with his total disbelief of the story Unorna had told him. But he did not answer her immediately, for he found himself in a very difficult position. He would neither do anything in the least discourteous beyond admitting frankly that he had not believed her, when she taxed him with incredulity, nor would say anything which might serve her as a stepping-stone for returning to her original situation. He was, perhaps, inclined to blame her somewhat less than at first, and her changed manner in speaking of Kafka somewhat encouraged his leniency. A man will forgive, or at least condone, much harshness to others when he is thoroughly aware that it has been exhibited out of love for himself, and a man of the wanderer's character cannot help feeling a sort of chivalrous respect and delicate forbearance for a woman who loves him sincerely though against his will, while he will avoid with an almost exaggerated prudence the least word which could be interpreted as an expression of reciprocal tenderness. He runs the risk, at the same time, of being thrust into the ridiculous position of the man who, though young, assumes the manner and speech of age, and delivers himself of grave paternal advice to one who looks upon him, not as an elder, but as her chosen mate. After Unorna had spoken, the wanderer, therefore, held his peace. He inclined his head a little, as though to admit that her plea of madness might not be wholly imaginary, but he said nothing. He sat looking at Israel Kafka's sleeping face and outstretched form, inwardly wondering whether the hours would seem very long before Keorg Arabian returned in the morning, and put an end to the situation. Unorna waited in vain for some response and at last spoke again. "'Yes,' she said, "'I was mad. You cannot understand it. 
I dare say you cannot even understand how I speak of it now, and yet I cannot help speaking." Her manner was more natural and quiet than it had been since the moment of Kafka's appearance in the cemetery. The wanderer noticed the tone. There was an element of real sadness in it, with a leaven of bitter disappointment and a savor of heartfelt contrition. She was in earnest now, as she had been before, but in a different way. He could hardly refuse her a word in answer. Unorna, he said gravely, remember that you are leaving me no choice. I cannot leave you alone with that poor fellow, and so whatever you wish to say I must hear. But it would be much better to say nothing about what has happened this evening, better for you and for me. Neither men nor women always mean exactly what they say. We are not angels. Is it not best to let the matter drop?" Unorna listened quietly, her eyes upon his face. "'You are not so hard with me as you were,' she said thoughtfully, after a moment's hesitation, and there was a touch of gratitude in her voice. As she felt the dim possibility of a return to her former relations of friendship with him, Beatrice and the scene in the church seemed to be very far away. Again the wanderer found it difficult to answer. "'It is not for me to be hard, as you call it,' he said quietly. There was a scarcely perceptible smile on his face, brought there not by any feeling of satisfaction, but by his sense of his own almost laughable perplexity. He saw that he was very near being driven to the ridiculous necessity of giving her some advice of the paternal kind. "'It is not for me either to talk to you of what you have done to Israel Kafka to-day,' he confessed. "'Do not oblige me to say anything about it. It will be much safer. You know it all better than I do, and you understand your own reasons, as I never can. If you are sorry for him now, so much the better. You will not hurt him any more if you can help it. If you will say that much about the future, I shall be very glad, I confess. Do you think that there is anything which I will not do, if you ask it? Unorna asked very earnestly. I do not know, the wanderer answered, trying to seem to ignore the meaning conveyed by her tone. Some things are harder to do than others. Ask me the hardest, she exclaimed. Ask me to tell you the whole truth. No, he said firmly, in the hope of checking an outburst of passionate speech. What you have thought and done is no concern of mine. If you have done anything that you are sorry for, without my knowledge, I do not wish to know of it. I have seen you do many good and kind acts during the last month, and I would rather leave those memories untouched as far as possible. You may have had an object in doing them which in itself was bad. I do not care. The deeds were good. Take credit for them, and let me give you credit for them. That will do neither of us any harm." "'I could tell you, if you would let me—' "'Do not tell me,' he interrupted. "'I repeat, that I do not wish to know. The one thing that I have seen is bad enough. Let that be all. Do you not see that? Besides, I am myself the cause of it in a measure, unwilling enough, heaven knows." "'The only cause,' said Unorna bitterly. Then I am in some way responsible. I am not quite without blame. We men never are in such cases. If I reproach you, I must reproach myself as well." "'Reproach yourself? Ah, no! What can you say against yourself?' She could not keep the love out of her voice, if she would. Her bitterness had been for herself. "'I will not go into that,' he answered. "'I am to blame in one way or another. Let us say no more about it. Will you let the matter rest? And let bygones be bygones, and be friends to each other as we were this morning?' she asked, with a ray of hope. The wanderer was silent for a few seconds. His difficulties were increasing. A while ago he had told her, as an excuse for herself, that men and women did not always mean exactly what they say, and even now he did not set himself up in his own mind as an exception to the rule. 
very honorable and truthful men do not act upon any set of principles in regard to truth and honor. Their instinctively brave actions and naturally noble truthfulness make those principles which are held up to the unworthy for imitation, by those whose business is the teaching of what is good. The wanderer's only hesitation lay between answering the question or not answering it. "'Shall we be friends again?' Unorna asked a second time, in a low tone. "'Shall we go back to the beginning?' "'I do not see how that is possible,' he answered slowly. Unorna was not like him, and did not understand such a nature as his as she understood Keorg Arabian. She had believed that he would at least hold out some hope. "'You might have spared me that,' she said, turning her face away. There were tears in her voice. A few hours earlier his answer would have brought fire to her eyes and anger to her voice, but a real change had come over her, not lasting, perhaps, but strong in its immediate effects. "'Not even a little friendship left?' she said, breaking the silence that followed. "'I cannot change myself,' he answered, almost wishing that he could. "'I ought, perhaps,' he added, as though speaking to himself. I have done enough harm as it is. Harm? To whom? She looked round suddenly, and he saw the moisture in her eyes. To him, he replied, glancing at Kafka, and to you. You loved him once. I have ruined his life. Loved him? No, I never loved him. She shook her head, wondering whether she spoke the truth. You must have made him think so. I? No, he is mad. But she shrank before his honest look and suddenly broke down. No, I will not lie to you. You are too true. Yes, I loved him, or I thought I did, until you came and I saw that there was no one. But she checked herself as she felt the blood rising to her cheeks. She could blush still and still be ashamed. Even she was not all bad, now that she was calm and that the change had come over her. "'You see,' the wanderer said gently, "'I am to blame for it all.' "'For it all? No, not for the thousandth part of it all. What blame have you in being what you are? Blame God in heaven for making such a man. Blame me for what you know. Blame me for all that you will not let me tell you.' Blame Kafka for his mad belief in me, and Keorg Arabian for the rest, but do not blame yourself. Oh, no, not that. Do not talk like that, Unorna, he said. Be just first. What is justice? she asked. Then she turned her head away again. If you knew what justice means for me, you would not ask me to be just. You would be more merciful." You exaggerate. He spoke kindly, but she interrupted him. No, you do not know, that is all, and you can never guess. There is only one man living who could imagine such things as I have done and tried to do. He is Keorg Arabian, but he would have been wiser than I, perhaps. She relapsed into silence. Before her rose the dim altar in the church, the shadowy figure of Beatrice standing up in the dark the horrible sacrilege that was to have been done. Her face grew dark with fear of her own soul. The wanderer went so far as to try and distract her from her gloomy thoughts out of pure kindness of heart. "'I am no theologian,' he said. "'But I fancy that in the long reckoning the intention goes far more than the act.' "'The intention!' she cried, looking back with a start. "'If that be true!' With a shudder she buried her face in her two hands, pressing them to her eyes as though to blind them to some awful sight. Then, with a short struggle, she turned to him again. "'There is no forgiveness for me in heaven,' she said. "'Shall there be none on earth, not even a little from you to me?' "'There is no question of forgiveness between you and me. You have not injured me, but Israel Kafka.' Judge for yourself which of us two, he or I, has anything to forgive. 
I am today what I was yesterday and may be tomorrow. He lies there, dying of his love for you, if ever a man died for love. And as though that were not enough, you have tortured him. Well, I will not speak of it. But that is all. I know nothing of the deeds or intentions of which you accuse yourself. You are tired, overwrought, worn out with all this. What shall I say? It is natural enough, I suppose. You say there is no question of forgiveness, she said, interrupting him, but speaking more calmly. What is it, then? What is the real question? If you have nothing to forgive, why can we not be friends as we were before? There is something besides that needed. It is not enough that of two people neither should have injured the other. You have broken something, destroyed something. I cannot mend it. I wish I could. You wish you could? She repeated earnestly. I wish that the thing had not been done. I wish that I had not seen what I saw today. We should be where we were this morning, and he perhaps would not be here. It must have come some day, Unorna said. He must have seen that I loved, that I loved you. Is there any use in not speaking plainly now? Then, at some other time, in some other place, he would have done what he did, and I should have been angry and cruel, for it is my nature to be cruel when I am angry, and to be angry easily at that. Men talk so easily of self-control, and self-command, and dignity, and self-respect. They have not loved. That is all. I am not angry now, nor cruel. I am sorry for what I did, and I would undo it, if deeds were nots and wishes deeds. I am sorry, beyond all words to tell you. How poor it sounds now that I have said it! You do not even believe me. You are wrong. I know that you are in earnest. How do you know? she asked bitterly. Have I never lied to you? If you believed me, you would forgive me. If you forgave me, your friendship would come back. I cannot even swear to you that I am telling the truth. Heaven would not be my witness now if I told a thousand truths, each truer than the last. I have nothing to forgive, the wanderer said, almost wearily. I have told you so. You have not injured me, but him. But if it meant a whole world to me, no, for I am nothing to you. But if it cost you nothing, but the little breath that can carry the three words, would you say it? Is it much to say? Is it like saying, I love you, or I honor you, respect you? It is so little and would mean so much. To me it can mean nothing, unless you ask me to forgive you deeds of which I know nothing. And then it means still less to me. Will you say it, only say the three words once? I forgive you, said the wanderer quietly. It cost him nothing, and to him meant less. Unorna bent her head and was silent. It was something to have heard him say it, though he could not guess the least of the sins which she made it include. She herself hardly knew why she had so insisted. Perhaps it was only the longing to hear the words kind in themselves, if not in tone, nor in his meaning of them. Possibly, too, she felt a dim presentiment of her coming end, and would take it with her that infinitesimal grain of pardon to the state in which she hoped for no other forgiveness. "'It was good of you to say it,' she said at last. A long silence followed, during which the thoughts of each went their own way. Suddenly Israel Kafka stirred in his sleep. The wanderer went quickly forward and knelt down beside him and arranged the silken pillow as best he could. Unorna was on the other side almost as soon. With a tenderness of expression and touch which nothing can describe, she moved the sleeping head into a comfortable position and smoothed the cushion, and drew up the furs disturbed by the nervous hands. The wanderer let her have her way. When she had finished their eyes met. He could not tell whether she was asking his approval and word of encouragement, but he withheld neither. "'You are very gentle with him. He would thank you if he could.' 
Did you not tell me to be kind to him? she said. I am keeping my word. But he would not thank me. He would kill me if he were awake. The wanderer shook his head. He was ill and mad with pain, he answered. He did not know what he was doing. When he wakes, it will be different. Unorna rose, and the wanderer followed her. You cannot believe that I care, she said, as she resumed her seat. He is not you. My soul would not be the nearer to peace for a word of his. For a long time she sat quite still, her hands lying idly in her lap, her head bent wearily as though she bore a heavy burden. Can you not rest? the wanderer asked at length. I can watch alone. No, I cannot rest. I shall never rest again. The words came slowly, as though spoken to herself. Do you bid me to go? she asked after a time, looking up and seeing his eyes fixed on her. Bid you go? In your own house? The tone was one of ordinary courtesy. Unorna smiled sadly. I would rather you struck me than you spoke to me like that, she exclaimed. You have no need of such civil forbearance with me. If you bid me go, I will go. If you bid me stay, I will not move. Only speak frankly. Say which you would prefer. Then stay, said the wanderer simply. She bowed her head slightly and was silent again. A distant clock chimed the hour. The morning was slowly drawing near. And you, said Unorna, looking up at the sound, will you not rest? Why should you not sleep? I am not tired. You do not trust me, I think, she answered sadly, and yet you might, you might. Her voice died away dreamily. Trust you to watch that poor man? Indeed I do. You were not acting just now, when you touched him so tenderly. You are in earnest. You will be kind to him, and I thank you for it. And you yourself? Do you fear nothing from me, if you should sleep before my eyes? Do you not fear that in your unconsciousness I might touch you and make you more unconscious still, and make you dream dreams and see visions? The wanderer looked at her and smiled incredulously, partly out of scorn for the imaginary danger, and partly because something told him that she had changed and would not attempt any of her witchcraft upon him. No, he answered. I am not afraid of that. You are right, she said gravely. My sins are enough already. The evil is sufficient. Do as you will. If you can sleep, then sleep in peace. If you will watch, watch with me. Then neither spoke again. Unorna bent her head, as she had done before. The wanderer leaned back, resting comfortably against the cushion of the high carved chair, his eyes directed towards the place where Israel Kafka lay. The air was warm, the scent of the flowers sweet but not heavy. The silence was intense, for even the little fountain was still. He had watched almost all night, and his eyelids drooped. He forgot Unorna, and thought only of the sick man, trying to fix his attention on the pale head as it lay under the bright light. When Unorna looked up at last she saw that he was asleep. At first she was surprised, in spite of what she had said to him half an hour earlier, for she herself could not have closed her eyes and felt that she could never close them again. Then she sighed. It was but one proof more of his supreme indifference. He had not even cared to speak to her, and if she had not constantly spoken to him throughout the hours they had passed together, he would perhaps have been sleeping long before now. And yet she feared to wake him, and was almost glad that he was unconscious. In the solitude she could gaze on him to her heart's desire, she could let her eyes look their fill, and no one could say her nay. He must be very tired, she thought, and she vaguely wondered why she felt no bodily weariness, when her soul was so heavy. She sat still and watched him. It might be the last time, she thought, 
for who could tell what would happen tomorrow? She shuddered as she thought of it all. What would Beatrice do? What would Sister Paul say? How much would she tell of what she had seen? How much had she really seen which she could tell clearly? There were terrible possibilities in the future if all were known. Such deeds, and even the attempt at such deeds as she had tried to do, could be judged by the laws of the land, she might be brought to trial, if she lived, as a common prisoner, and held up to the execration of the world in all her shame and guilt. But death would be worse than that. As she thought of that other judgment, she grew dizzy with horror, as she had been when the idea had first entered her brain. Then she was conscious that she was again looking at the wanderer as he lay back asleep in his tall chair. The pale and noble face expressed the stainless soul and the manly character. She saw in it the peace she had lost, and yet knew that through him she had lost her peace forever. It was, perhaps, the last time. Never again, perhaps, after the morning had broken, should she look on what she loved best on earth. She would be gone, ruined, dead, perhaps. And he, he would be still himself. He would remember her, half carelessly, half in wonder, as a woman who had once been almost his friend. That would be all that would be left of him in her, beyond a memory of the repulsion he had felt for her deeds. She fancied she could have met the worst in the future less hopelessly if he could have remembered her a little more kindly when all was over. Even now it might be in her power to cast a veil upon the pictures in his mind. But the mere thought was horrible to her, though a few hours before she had hardly trembled at the doing of a frightful sacrilege. In that short time the humiliation of failure, the realization of what she had almost done, above all the ever-rising tide of a real and passionate love, had swept away many familiar landmarks in her thoughts, and had turned much to lead which had once seemed brighter than gold. She hated the very idea of using again those arts which had so directly wrought her utter destruction. But she longed to know that, in the world whither he would doubtless go to-morrow, he would bear with him one kind memory of her, one natural friendly thought not grafted upon his mind by her power, but growing of its own self in his inmost heart. Only a friendly memory, nothing more than that. She rose noiselessly and came to his side and looked down into his face. Very long she stood there, motionless as a statue, beautiful as a morning angel. It was so little that she asked. It was so little compared with all she had hoped, or in comparison with all she had demanded, so little in respect of what she had given. For she had given her soul and in return she asked only for one small kindly thought when all should be over. She bent down as she stood and touched his cool forehead with her lips. "'Sleep on, my beloved,' she said in a voice that murmured softly and sadly. She started a little at what she had done, and drew back, half afraid, like an innocent girl. But as though he had obeyed her words, he seemed to sleep more deeply still. He must be very tired, she thought, to sleep like that, but she was thankful that the soft kiss, the first and last, had not waked him. "'Sleep on,' she said again, in a whisper scarcely audible to herself. "'Forget you, Norna, if you cannot think of her mercifully and kindly. Sleep on, you have the right to rest, and I can never rest again.' You have forgiven. Forget, too, then, unless you can remember better things of me than I have deserved in your memory. Let her take her kingdom back. It was never mine. Remember what you will. Forget at least the wrong I did, and forgive the wrong you never knew, for you will know it surely some day. Ah, love, I love you so. Dream but one dream, and let me think I can take her place. She never loved you more than I, she never can. She would not have done what I have done. Dream only that I am Beatrice for this once. Then, when you wake, you will not think so cruelly of me. 
Oh, that I might be she, and you your loving self, that I might be she for one day in thought and word, in deed and voice, in face and soul. Dear love, you would never know it, yet I should know that you had had one loving thought for me. You would forget. It would not matter then to you, for you would have only dreamed, and I should have the certainty, forever, to take with me always. As though the words carried a meaning with them to his sleeping senses, a look of supreme and almost heavenly happiness stole over his sleeping face. But Unorna could not see it. She had turned suddenly away, burying her face in her hands upon the back of her own chair. "'Are there no miracles left in heaven?' she moaned, half whispering lest she should wake him. "'Is there no miracle of deeds undone again and of forgiveness given for me? God, God, that we should be forever what we make ourselves!' There were no tears in her eyes now, as there had been twice that night. In her despair, that fountain of relief, shallow always and not apt to overflow, was dried up and scorched with pain. And, for the time at least, worse things were gone from her, though she suffered more. As though some portion of her passionate wish had been fulfilled, she felt that she could never do again what she had done. She felt that she was truthful now as he was, and that she knew evil from good even as Beatrice knew it. The horror of her sins took new growth in her changed vision. "'Was I lost from the first beginning?' she asked passionately. "'Was I born to be all I am, and foredestined to do all I have done? Was she born an angel, and I a devil from hell? What is it all? What is this life, and what is that other beyond it?' Behind her, in his chair, the wanderer still slept. Still his face wore the radiant look of joy that had so suddenly come into it as she turned away. He scarcely breathed, so calmly he slept. But Unorna did not raise her head nor look at him, and on the carpet near her feet Israel Kafka lay as still and as deeply unconscious as the wanderer himself. By a strange destiny she sat there, between the two men in whom her whole life had been wrecked, and she alone was waking. When she at last raised her eyes the dawn was breaking. Through the transparent roof of glass a cold gray light began to descend upon the warm, still brightness of the lamps. The shadows changed, the colors grew more cold, the dark nooks among the heavy foliage less black. Israel Kafka's face was ghostly and livid. The wanderers had the alabaster transparency that comes upon some strong men in sleep. Still, neither stirred. Unorna turned from one and looked upon the other. For the first time she saw how he had changed and wondered. "'How peacefully he sleeps,' she thought. "'He is dreaming of her.' The dawn came stealing on, not soft and blushing as in southern lands, but cold, resistless, and grim as ancient fate not the maiden herald of the sun with rose-tipped fingers and grey, liquid eyes, but hard, cruel, sullen, and less darkness following upon a greater and going before a dull, sunless, and heavy day. The door opened somewhat noisily, and a brisk step fell upon the marble pavement. Unorna rose noiselessly to her feet, and hastening along the open space, came face to face with Keorg Arabian. He stopped and looked up at her from beneath his heavy brows, with surprise and suspicion. She raised one finger to her lips. "'You here already?' he asked, obeying her gesture and speaking in a low voice. "'Hush! hush!' she whispered, not satisfied. "'They are asleep. You will wake them.' Keorg came forward. He could move quietly enough when he chose. He glanced at the wanderer. He looks comfortable enough, he whispered, half contemptuously. Then he bent down over Israel Kafka and carefully examined his face. To him the ghastly pallor meant nothing. It was but the natural result of excessive exhaustion. Put him into a lethargy, he said under his breath, but with authority in his manner. 
Unorna shook her head. Keyork's small eyes brightened angrily. "'Do it,' he said. "'What is this caprice? Are you mad? I want to take his temperature without waking him.' Unorna folded her arms. "'Do you want him to suffer more?' asked Keyork with a diabolical smile. "'If so, I will wake him by all means. I am always at your service, you know.' "'Will he suffer, if he wakes naturally?' "'Horribly. In the head.' Unorna knelt down and let her hand rest a few seconds on Kafka's brow. The features, drawn with pain, immediately relaxed. "'You have hypnotized the one,' grumbled Keorg as he bent down again. "'I cannot imagine why you should object to doing the same for the other.' "'The other?' Unorna repeated in surprise. "'Our friend there, in the armchair.' It is not true. He fell asleep of himself." Keorg smiled again, incredulously this time. He had already applied his pocket-thermometer and looked at his watch. Unorna had risen to her feet, disdaining to defend herself against the imputation expressed in his face. Some minutes passed in silence. "'He has no fever,' said Keorg, looking at the little instrument. I will call the individual, and we will take him away." Where? To his lodging, of course. Where else? He turned and went towards the door. In a moment Unorna was kneeling again by Kafka's side, her hand upon his forehead, her lips close to his ear. "'This is the last time that I will use my power on you or upon anyone,' she said quickly, for the time was short. "'Obey me, as you must. Do you understand me?' Will you obey?" "'Yes,' came the faint answer, as from very far off. "'You will wake two hours from now. You will not forget all that has happened, but you will never love me again. I forbid you ever to love me again. Do you understand?' "'I understand.' "'You will only forget that I have told you this though you will obey. You will see me again, and if you can forgive me of your own free will, forgive me then. That must be of your own free will. Wake in two hours of yourself, without pain or sickness." Again she touched his forehead, and then sprang to her feet. Keorg was coming back with his dumb servant. At a sign, the individual lifted Kafka from the floor, taking him from the wanderer's furs and wrapping him in the others which Keorg had brought. The strong man walked away with his burden as though he were carrying a child. Keorg Arabian lingered a moment. "'What made you come back so early?' he asked. "'I will not tell you,' she answered, drawing back. "'No? Well, I am not curious. You have an excellent opportunity now.' "'An opportunity?' Unorna repeated with a cold interrogative. "'Excellent,' said the little man, standing on tiptoe to reach her ear, for she would not bend her head. "'You have only to whisper into his ear that you are Beatrice, and he will believe you for the rest of his life.' "'Go,' said Unorna. Though the word was not spoken above her breath, it was fierce and commanding. Keorg Arabian smiled in an evil way, shrugged his shoulders, and left her. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 24 Unorna was left alone with the wanderer. His attitude did not change, his eyes did not open, as she stood before him. Still he wore the look which had at first attracted Keorg Arabian's attention, and which had amazed Unorna herself. It was the expression that had come into his face in the old cemetery, when in his sleep she had spoken to him of love. He is dreaming of her, Unorna said to herself again, as she turned sadly away. 
but since Keyork had been with her, a doubt had assailed her which painfully disturbed her thoughts, so that her brow contracted with anxiety, and from time to time she drew a quick hard breath. Keyork had taken it for granted that the wanderer's sleep was not natural. She tried to recall what had happened shortly before dawn, but it was no wonder that her memory served her ill, and refused to bring back distinctly the words she had spoken. Her whole being was unsettled and shaken, so that she found it hard to recognize herself. The stormy hours through which she had lived since yesterday had left their trace. The lack of rest, instead of producing physical exhaustion, had brought about an excessive mental weariness, and it was not easy for her now to find all the connecting links between her actions. Then, above all else, there was the great revulsion that had swept over her and after her last and greatest plan of evil had failed causing in her such a change as could hardly have seemed natural or even possible to a calm person watching her inmost thoughts. And yet such sudden changes take place daily in the world of crime and passion. In one uncalled for confession, of which it is hard to trace the smallest reasonable cause, the intricate wickedness of a lifetime are revealed and repeated. In the mysterious impulse of a moment, the murderer turns back and delivers himself to justice. Under an influence for which there is often no accounting, the woman who has sinned securely through long years lays bare her guilt and throws herself upon the mercy of the man whom she has so skilfully and consistently deceived. We know the fact. The reason we cannot know. Perhaps, to nature's not wholly bad, sin is a poison of which the moral organization can only bear a certain fixed amount, great or small, before rejecting it altogether and with loathing. We do not know. We speak of the workings of conscience, not understanding what we mean. It is like that subtle something, which we call electricity. We can play with it, command it, lead it, neutralize it, and die of it, make light and heat with it, or language and sound, kill with it and cure with it, while absolutely ignorant of its nature. We are no nearer to a definition of it than the Greek who rubbed a bit of amber and lifted with it a tiny straw, and from amber, electron called the something electricity. Are we even as near as that to a definition of the human conscience? The change that had come over Unorna, whether it was to be lasting or not, was profound. The circumstances under which it took place are plain enough. The reasons must be left to themselves. It remains only to tell the consequences which thereon follow. The first of these was a hatred of that extraordinary power with which nature had endowed her, which brought with it a determination never again to make use of it for any evil purpose, and, if possible, never even for good. But as though her unhappy fate were forever fighting against her good impulses, that power of hers had exerted itself unconsciously since her resolution had been formed. Georg Arabian's words, and his evident though unspoken disbelief in her denial, showed that he at least was convinced of the fact that the wanderer was not sleeping a natural sleep. Unorna tried to recall what she had done and said, but all was vague and indistinct. Of one thing she was sure. She had not laid her hand upon his forehead, and she had not intentionally done any of those things which she had always believed necessary for producing the results of hypnotism. She had not willed him to do anything. She thought, and she felt sure that she had pronounced no words of the nature of a command. Step by step, she tried to reconstruct for her comfort a detailed recollection of what had passed, but every effort in that direction was fruitless. Like many men far wiser than herself, she believed in the mechanics of hypnotic science, in the touches, in the passes, in the fixed look, in the will to fascinate. More than once, Keyork Arabian had scoffed at what he called her superstitions, and had maintained that all the varying phenomena of hypnotism, all the witchcraft of the darker ages, all the visions undoubtedly shown to wandering eyes by medieval sorcerers, were traceable to moral influence, and to no other cause. Unorna could not accept his reasoning. For her, there was a deeper and yet more material mystery in it, as in her own life, a mystery which she cherished as an inheritance, which impressed her with a sense of her own strange destiny and of the gulf which separated her from other women. She could not detach herself from the idea that the supernatural played a part in all her doings, and she clung to the use of gestures and passes and words in the exercise of her art, in which she fancied a hidden and secret meaning to exist. Certain things had especially impressed her. The not uncommon answer of hypnotics to the question concerning their identity, I am the image in your eyes, 
is undoubtedly elicited by the fact that their extraordinarily acute and perhaps magnifying vision perceives the image of themselves in the eyes of the operator with abnormal distinctness and not impossibly of a size quite incompatible with the dimensions of the pupil to unorna the answer meant something more it suggested the actual presence of the person she was influencing in her own brain and whenever she was undertaking anything especially difficult she endeavoured to obtain the reply relating to the image as soon as possible. In the present case, she was sure that she had done none of the things which she considered necessary to produce a definite result. She was totally unconscious of having impressed upon the sleeper any suggestion of her will. Whatever she had said, she had addressed the words to herself without any attention that they should be heard or understood. These reflections comforted her as she paced the marble floor, and yet Keyork's remark rang in her ears and disturbed her. She knew how vast his experience was and how much he could tell by a single glance at a human face. He had been familiar with every phase of hypnotism long before she had known him, and might reasonably be supposed to know by inspection whether the sleep were natural or not. That a person hypnotized may appear to sleep as naturally as one not under the influence is certain, but the condition of rest is also very often different to a practiced eye from that of an ordinary slumber. There is a fixity in the expression of the face, and in the attitude of the body, which cannot continue under ordinary circumstances. He had perhaps noticed both signs in the wanderer. She went back to his side and looked at him intently. She had scarcely dared to do so before, and she felt that she might have been mistaken. The light, too, had changed, for it was broad day, though the lamps were still burning. Yet, even now, she could not tell. Her judgment of what she saw was disturbed by many intertwining thoughts. At least, he was happy. Whatever she had done, if she had done anything, it had not hurt him. There was no possibility of misinterpreting the sleeping man's expression. She wished that he would wake, though she knew how the smile would fade, how the features would grow cold and indifferent, and how the grey eyes she loved would open with a look of annoyance at seeing her before him. It was like a vision of happiness in a house of sorrow to see him lying there, so happy in his sleep, so loving, so peaceful. She could make it all to last, too, if she would, and realized that with a sudden pang. The woman of whom he dreamed, whom he had loved so faithfully and sought so long, was very near him. A word from Unorna, and Beatrice could come and find him as he lay asleep, and herself opened the dear eyes. Was that sacrifice to be asked of her before she was taken away to the expiation of her sins? Fate could not be so very cruel, and yet the mere idea was an added suffering. The longer she looked at him, the more the possibility grew and tortured her. After all, it was almost certain that they would meet now, and at the meeting she felt sure that all his memory would return. Why should she do anything? Why should she raise her hand to bring them to each other? It was too much to ask. Was it not enough that both were free, and both in the same city together, and that she had vowed neither to hurt nor hinder him? If it was their destiny to be joined together, it would so happen surely in the natural course. If not, was it her part to join them? The punishment of her sins, whatever it should be, she could not bear, but this thing she could not do. She passed her hand across her eyes as though to drive it away, and her thoughts came back to the point from which they had started. The suspense became unbearable when she realized that she did not know in what condition the wanderer would wake, nor whether, if left to nature, he would wake at all. She could not endure it any longer. She touched his sleeve lightly, at first, and then more heavily. She moved his arm. It was passive in her hand and lay where she placed it. Yet she would not believe that she had made him sleep. She drew back and looked at him. Then her anxiety overcame her. Wake! she cried loud. For God's sake, wake! I cannot bear it! His eyes opened at the sound of her voice, naturally and quietly. Then they grew wide and deep and fixed themselves in a great wonder of many seconds. Then Unorma saw no more. Strong arms lifted her suddenly from her feet and pressed her fiercely and carried her, and she hid her face. A voice she knew sounded, and she had never heard it sound, nor hoped to hear it. Beatrice, it cried, and nothing more. In the presence of that strength, in the ringing of that cry, Unorna was helpless. She had no power of thought left in her, as she felt herself borne along, body and soul, in the rush of a passion more masterful than her own. Then she was on her feet again, but his arms were round her still, 
and hers, whether she would or not, were clasped about his neck. Dreams, truth, faith, kept her broken. Hell and heaven itself were swept away, all wrecked together in the tide of love. And through it all, his voice was in her ear. Love, love, at last! From all these years you have come back! At last, at last! Broken and almost void of sense, the words came then. Through the storm of his kisses and the tempest of her tears, she could no more resist him nor draw herself away than the frail ship, wind driven through crashing waves, can turn and face the blast, no more than the long dry grass can turn and quench the roaring flame, no more than the drooping willow bough can dam the torrent and force it backwards up the steep mountain side. In those short false moments, when Orna knew what happiness could mean, torn from herself, lifted high above the misery and the darkness of her real life, it was all true to her. There was no other Beatrice but herself, no other woman whom he had ever loved. An enchantment greater than her own was upon her and held her in bonds she could neither bend nor break. She was sitting in her own chair now, and he was kneeling before her, holding her hands and looking up to her. For him the world held nothing else. For him her hair was black as night. For him the unlike eyes were dark and fathomless. For him the heavy marble hand was light, responsive, delicate. For him her face was the face of Beatrice, as he had last seen it long ago. The years had passed, indeed, and he had sought her through many lands, but she had come back to him the same, in the glory of her youth, in the strength of her love, in the divinity of her dark beauty, his always, through it all, his now, forever. For a long time he did not speak. The words rose to his lips and failed of utterance as the first mist of early morning is drawn heavenwards to vanish in the rising sun. The long-drawn breath could have made no sound of sweeter meaning than the unspoken speech that rose in the deep gray eyes. Nature's grand organ, touched by hands divine, can yield no chord more moving than a lover's sigh. Words came at last, as after the welcome shower in summer's heat the song of birds rings through the woods, and out across the fields upon the clear earth-scented air words fresh from their long rest within his heart unused in years of loneliness but unforgotten and familiar still untarnished jewels from the inmost depths rich treasures from the storehouse of a deathless faith diamonds of truth rubies of passion pearls of devotion studding the golden links of the chain of love at last at last at last life of my life the day is come that is not day without you and now it will always be day for us too day without end and sun for ever and yet i have seen you always in my night just as i see you now as i hold your dear hands i have held them day by day and year by year and i have smoothed that black hair of yours that i love and kissed those dark eyes of yours many and many a thousand times it has been so long, love, so very long, but I knew it would come some day. I knew I should find you, for you have been always with me, dear, always and everywhere. The world is all full of you, for I have wandered through it all and taken you with me and made every place yours with the thought of you and the love of you and the worship of you. For me, there is not an ocean, nor a sea, nor a river, nor rock, nor island, nor broad continent of earth that has not known Beatrice and loved her name. Heart of my heart, soul of my soul, the nights and the days without you, the lands and the oceans where you were not, the endlessness of the, this little world that hid you somewhere, the littleness of the whole universe without you, how can you ever know what it has done to me? And so it is gone at last, gone as a dream of sickness in the morning of health, Gone is the blackness of storm clouds and the sweep of the clear west wind. Gone is the shadow of evil before the face of an angel of light. And I know it all. I see it all in your passing eyes. You knew I was true, and you knew I sought you and would find you at last. And you have waited, and there has been no other, not the thought of another, not the passing image of another between us. For I know there has not been that, and I should have known it anywhere in all these years. The chill of it would have found me. The sharpness of it would have been in my heart. No matter where, no matter how far. Yet say it. Say it once. Say that you have loved me too. God knows how I have loved you. How I love you now, Unorna said in a low, unsteady voice. 
The light that had been in his face grew brighter still as she spoke. While as she looked at him, wondering, her head thrown back against the high chair, her eyelids wet and drooping, her lips still parted, her hands in his. Small wonder if he had loved her for herself. She was so beautiful. Small wonder it would have been if she had taken Beatrice's place in his heart during those weeks of close and daily converse. But that first great love had left no fertile ground in which to plant another seed, no warmth of kindness under which the tender shoot might grow to strength, no room beneath its heaven for other branches to grow. Alone it had stood in majesty as a lordly tree, straight, tall, and evergreen, on a silent mountain top. Alone it had borne the burden of grief's heavy snows, unbent for all its loneliness. It had stood against the raging tempest, and green still, in all its giant strength of stem and branch, in all its kingly robe of unwithered foliage. Unscathed, unshaken, it yet stood. Neither storm nor lightning, wind nor rain, sun nor snow had prevailed against it to dry it up and cast it down that another might grow in its place. Yet this love was not for her to whom he spoke, and she knew it as she answered him, though she answered truly from the fullness of her heart. She had cast an enchantment over him unwittingly, and she had taken in the toils of her own magic, even as she had sworn that she would never again put forth her powers. She shuddered as she realized it all. In a few short moments she had felt his kisses and heard his words and been clasped to his heart as she had many a time madly hoped. But in those moments, too, she had known the truth of her woman's instinct when it had told her that love must be for herself and for her own sake or not be love at all. The falseness, the fathomless untruth of it, would have been bad enough alone. But the truth that was so strong made it horrible. Had she but inspired him in a burning love for herself, however much against his will, it would have been very different. She would have heard her name from his lips. She would have known that all, however false, however artificial, was for herself while it might last. To know that it was real and not for her was intolerable. To see this love of his break out at last, this other love which she had dreaded, against which she had fought, which she had met with a jealousy as strong as itself, and struggled with and buried under an imposed forgetfulness, to feel its great waves surging around her and beating up against her, was more than she could bear. Her face grew whiter and her hands were cold. She dreaded each moment lest he could call her Beatrice again and say that her fair hair was black and that he loved those deep dark eyes of her there had been one moment of happiness in that first kiss and the first pleasure of those strong arms the night descended the hands that held her had not been yet unclasped the kiss was not cold upon her cheek the first great cry of his love had hardly died away in the softened echo and her punishment was upon her his words were lashes, his touch poison, his eyes avenging fires. As in nature's great alchemy, the diamond and the blackened coal are one. As nature with the same elements pours life and death from the same vial with the same hand, so now the love which would have been life to Minorna was made worse than death because it was not for her. Yet the disguise was terribly perfect. The unconscious spell had done its work thoroughly. He took her for Beatrice, and her voice for Beatrice is there in the broad light, in the familiar place where he had so often talked with her for hours and known her for Unorna. But a few paces away was the very spot where she had fallen at his feet last night and wept and abused herself before him. There was the carpet on which Israel Kafka had lain throughout the long hours while they had watched together. Upon that table at her side a book lay, which they had read together but two days ago. In her own chair she sat, Unorna still, unchanged, unaltered save for him. She doubted her own senses as she heard him speak, and ever again the name of Beatrice rang in her ears. He looked at her hands, and knew them, all her black dress, and knew it for her own, and yet he poured out the eloquence of his love, kneeling, then standing, then sitting at her side, drawing her head to his shoulder and smoothing her fair hair, so black to him, with a gentle hand. She was passive through it all, as yet. There seemed to be no other way. He paused sometimes, then spoke again. Perhaps in the dream that possessed him, he heard her speak. Possibly he was unconscious of her silence, borne along by the torrent of his own long, pent-up speech. She could not tell. She did not care to know. 
Of one thing alone she thought, of how to escape from it all and be alone. She feared to move, still more to rise, not knowing what he would do. As he was now, she could not tell what effect her words would have if she spoke. It might be a passing state after all. What would the awakening be? Would his forgetfulness of Beatrice and his coldness to herself return with the subsidence of his passion? Far better than to see him and hear him as he was now. And yet there were moments now and then when he pronounced no name, when he recalled no memory of the past, when there was only the tenderness of love itself in his words, and then, as she listened, she could almost think it was for her. It was bitter joy, unreal and fantastic, but it was a relief. Had she loved him less, such a conflict between sense and senses would have been impossible even in imagination. But she loved him greatly, and the deep desire to be loved in turn was in her still, shaming her better thoughts, but sometimes ruling her in spite of herself and of the pain she suffered with each word self-applied. All the vast contradictions, all the measureless inconsistency, all the enormous selfishness of which human hearts are capable, had met in hers as in a battleground, fighting each other, rending what they found of her self amongst them, sometimes uniting to throw their whole weight together against the deep-rooted passion, sometimes taking side with it to drive out every other rival. It was shameful, base, despicable, and she knew it. A moment ago she had longed to tear herself away, to silence him, to stop her ears, anything not to hear those words that cut like whips and stung like scorpions. And now again she was listening for the next, eagerly, breathlessly, drunk with their sound and reveling almost in the unreality of their happiness they brought. More and more she despised herself as the intervals between one pang of suffering and the next grew longer, and the illusion deeper and more like reality. After all, it was he, and no other. It was the man she loved who was pouring out his own love into her ears, and smoothing her hair and pressing the hand he held. Had he not said it once, and more than once? What matter where, what matter how, provided that he loved? She had received the fulfillment of her wish. He loved her now. Under another name, in a vision, with another face and another voice, yet still she was herself. As in a storm, the thunderclaps came crashing through the air, deafening and appalling at first, then rolling swiftly into a far distance, fainter and fainter, till all is still and only the plash of the fast-falling rain is heard. So, as she listened, the tempest of her pain was passing away. Easier and easier it became to hear herself called Beatrice. Easier and easier it grew to take the other's place, to accept the kiss, the touch, the word, the pressure of the hand that were all another's due, and given to herself only for the mask she wore in his dream. And the tide of the great temptation rose and fell a little, and rose higher again each time, till it washed the fragile feet of the last good thought that lingered, taking refuge on the highest point above the waves. On and on it came, receding and coming back, higher and higher, surer and surer. Had she drawn back in time, it would have been so easy. Had she turned and fled, when the first moment of senseless joy was over, when she could still feel all the shame, and blush for all the abasement, it would have been over now, and she would have been safe. But she had learned to look upon the advancing water, and the sound of it had no more terror for her. It was very high now. Presently it would climb higher and close above her head. There were long intervals of silence now. The first rush of his speech had spent itself, for he had told her much and had heard it all, even through the mists of her changing moods. And now that he was silent, she longed to hear him speak again. She could never weary of that voice. It had been music to her in her days, when it had been full of cold indifference. Now each vibration roused high harmonies in her heart. Each note was a full chord, and all the chords made but one great progression. She longed to hear it all again wondering greatly how it could never have been not good to hear. Then with the great temptation came the less, enclosed within it, suddenly revealed to her. There was but one thing she hated in it all. That was the name. Would he not give her another? Her own, perhaps? She trembled as she thought of speaking. Would she still have Beatrice's voice? Might not her own break down the spell and destroy all at once? Yet she had spoken once before. She had told him that she loved him, and he had not been undeceived. Beloved, she said at last, lingering on the single word and then hesitating. He looked into her face, and as he drew her near to him, with happy eyes, she might speak, then, for he would hear 
tones not hers beloved i'm tired of my name will you not call me another she spoke very softly by another name he exclaimed surprised but smiling at what seemed a strange caprice yes it is a sad name to me it reminds me of many things of a time that is better forgotten since it is gone will you do it for me it will make it seem as though that time had never been and yet i love your own name he said thoughtfully it is so much or has been so much in all these years when i had nothing but your name to love will you not do it it is all i ask indeed i will if you would rather have it so do you think there is anything that i would not do if you asked it of me they were almost the words she had spoken to him that night when they were watching together by israel kafka's side she recognized them and a strange thrill of triumph ran through her what matter how what matter where the old reckless questions came to her mind again if he loved her and if he would but call her unorna what could it matter indeed was she not herself she smiled unconsciously i see it pleases you he said tenderly let it be as you wish what name will you choose for your dear self she hesitated she could not tell how far he might remember what was past and yet if he had remembered he would have seen where he was in the long time that had passed since his awakening did you ever in your long travels hear the name unorna she asked with a smile and a little hesitation unorna no i cannot remember it is a bohemian word it means she of february it has a pretty sound half familiar to me i wonder where i have heard it call me unorna then it will remind us that you have found me in february End of chapter 24